Hello, and welcome to episode 238 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. It is here, the best form of fantasy, according to me, which is the only opinion that matters. It is NFL DFS season. I am joined by two true grinders, professional DFS players, two of the most successful players in the history of the game. It is the Dinkbot himself, Drew Dinkmeyer. It is the pale one, Michael Leone. Dink, good morning. I'm glad that I'm on a podcast with Leone and I wasn't referred to as the pale one because I really, I, <laughs> it's, it's a strong competition between the two of us in terms of lack of sunlight and vitamin D. Uh, by the way, compared to these two, I am just, I mean, a bronze Adonis. I mean, it's not, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Leone, good morning. Good morning, Bronze Dodonis. How are you? I'm doing well. On today's episode, we're going to talk about a topic that there really are so many misconceptions about, and it tilts me so much, optimizers and how to use them. We're going to get into all things optimizers. Before we get into that, note that if you're interested in using an optimizer this season and using it correctly, as we're going to explain today, we have a special deal through our friends at Fantasy Labs. Go to the subscribe tab on Establish the Run, click the NFL Fantasy Labs optimizer link, and you'll find details on the deal. Basically, it's an add-on that gives you the optimizer preloaded with our continuously updating projections and ownership projections. All right, let's get into it here. I mean, I don't want to dumb it down too much, but I just got to get this off my chest. If I hear one more person say, if I had 150 lineups, I'd win also. I, I, can't, I, I can't take it anymore. Because you have the ability to enter 150 lineups for the mere price of a quarter on DraftKings. One quarter times 150. You can do it too and start printing. Or if it was a lock, you could take out a loan and start printing also. You'd pay back the loan immediately. Dink, why do people think that if they had 150 lineups, they'd win every time? It's driving me insane. Well, human beings are generally very optimistic about their own abilities and very pessimistic about the abilities uh, of everyone else around them. And you know, I've, as, as I've turned from a cash game player and a single lineup player to a multi-entry player over the years, uh, this is the, the criticism I get most frequently. And let me tell you, if you are a bad player, you will just accelerate your losses much quicker <laughs> by playing 150 lineups uh, than just playing one lineup each and every week. And so it's really, it's, it's really up to your skill level. And if, if you have a skill advantage over the field, being able to use more lineups and create sort of a portfolio of lineups uh, is, is uh, an additional advantage and allows you to potentially uh, create a higher return on investment. But if you are not <laughs> a skilled player at being able to create that portfolio over time, you are just going to accelerate your losses really, really quickly. And I think that's the, the aspect that a lot of people just don't understand in terms of um, the more lineups you're creating, the more upside you have, but also uh, the much deeper downside you have. You know, to me, like one of the biggest signs of intelligence is like humility and being humble. And it just goes back to this whole thing of the more that you know, the more you realize you don't know, right? Like the deeper you get into it, the more you understand something, the more you realize that you actually don't know. And so all that stuff just drives me crazy. I know most of you guys listen to this. Don't think like that. Or all the guys listening to this, hopefully don't think that. I just had to get that off my chest. The second thing about optimizers and, and all this stuff that drives me crazy is people assume there's like some special algorithm like behind the scenes that like Leone has like scrawled like on his chest somewhere that just spits out the nuts. Like like my idiot friends from college actually think there's just like, oh yeah, but they have the algorithm. It just gives you the right answer every time you play it and you print money. There is no special unique algorithm that's just spitting out the stone cold nuts. This is a very, very deep and complicated process that has much, 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 much more to do with understanding projections, player outcomes, usage, all that than any type of algorithm. So Leone, reveal to the people once and for all that you're not hiding from them a special code that just spits out the stones every week. Well, maybe I'm just hiding it from you. I want to keep it for myself. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you can't just go to an optimizer, load up some projections and hit print, you know, just run and, and print money. It's That's not the way it works. Uh, I think our projections are very good. I think Fantasy Labs Optimizer is very good. And the combination puts you in a position where if you do some other things, which Drew will touch on and touch on a YouTube video that he did, it's going to put you in position to win. But there's so much that goes into a 150 MME set. You know, where are your exposures? How are you balancing ownership across the lineup? How are you introducing correlation? 
into your lineups and so on and so on. You know, how are you accounting for ceiling in your lineups relative to, you know, kind of a, a mean median projection? So there's so many different factors across making a single lineup that there is no way to kind of just be able to like hit one button and run and have it give you exactly what you want. I mean, even in cash, we're talking about tournaments, but even in cash games, Adam, you know, as a cash game player, you have to think a little bit more deeply about, you know, the fragility of some of the assumptions made to get, go into the players projections and things like that. And, you know, kind of where you feel like your edges on your opponent, you know, kind of where maybe you're willing to take a wash or not. It's not even in a cash game setting. It's not just, you know, you know, you probably, it's probably a little easier to get closer to the right lineup, just running an optimal in a cash game setting, but even in that setting, it's not perfect. So it's certainly not perfect in a GPP setting where the dynamics are so multi-layered. Uh, you referred me as to uh, refer to me as a cash game player. I'll have you know that after winning the juke in week seventeen, uh, I prefer to now be called tournament bro. Uh, at eleven, Renaissance man. Yes, exactly. Okay. Dink has a ton. If you're interested in using an optimizer, Dink has a ton of content on the site and on YouTube about how to use the optimizer. Go down to the DFS analysis section in the drop down. Check out YouTube. Dink is all over there with screen shares how to use the optimizer correctly in a thoughtful way, not a jam in 150 and print mindless kind of way. I just want to go through a few points here, Dink, with you about what mistakes you see people make when they use optimizer. And the first one I think is something people struggle with big time. I mean, coming in with a plan because a lot of people are just like, well, I'll just take some projections. I'll run them. I'll take the top 150 lineups. I'll put them in and it's a print fest. What kind of plans are you talking about? People should come into a optimizer set with. And again, this is for people who want to run a lot of lineups through an optimizer. This is not, this is totally different than what we'll talk about later on another time with small field tournaments and stuff like that. Yeah, so I think what you guys were just referencing is probably my biggest pet peeve as somebody who has tried to put out a lot of multi-entry uh, content and tried to develop other people as multi-entry players as well, is this idea that essentially the optimizer is the tool that is going to be the thing that helps you win all the money, essentially, as opposed to the person operating the optimizer is going to want, be the one that, that makes all the money and all the decisions and everything. And that's really the difference. You have to view the optimizer as a tool that is helping take what is in your brain, in your head, in terms of what you want to see in your lineups and help creating them in a quicker way for you. If you rely, rely on it as the tool that is going to solve all the, the decisions for you, you're, you're really not doing anything that's going to be able to separate you from the field and you're not putting your print on the lineups. And so one of the biggest frustrations for me is when people kind of just want to like copy whatever settings I had the week before and use those for the next week or different things, because they're thinking that the optimizer is the thing that has all the answers when really the answers are within you in terms of what you want your portfolio of lineups to really look like. And so that's what I mean by saying people that go in without a plan. They're going in thinking, basically, I'm just going to hit this, this little print button and it's going to print money for me. And that, th those are going to answer my prayers. No, you need to go in with an idea of what your lineups are going to look like. What is kind of the max exposure you want on a, on a position? Do you want all of your lineups to be one quarterback stack? Do you want eight quarterbacks in your portfolio? Do you want five? Um, how many, how much correlation are you going to build into your lineups? And what you're doing is you're setting the framework for the optimizer to make lineups quickly for you that are taking the framework of your brain, what your decisions are and putting them into, into play. And that's really the most important thing. And so everybody's going to have a different and unique way to try to approach a slate and try to attack. And some people are going to have more concentration and they want to like, know that they're going to root for like, 10 guys on the slate. And those are going to be their 10 difference makers. And so they're going to allow people to go up to 70% uh, rostered on their, on their portfolio set. Whereas some people are going to say, no, I want to have kind of a more spread approach. And I want to have different lineup combinations that allow me if this, this type of game plays out that I can access it. And so really the people who are going in with a plan and they're reviewing their lineups and they're reviewing their portfolio and their exposures on all these different players that they're rostering, those are the ones that I think are going to have a better chance at being successful multi-entry players, as opposed to the people who just go in and are like, well, I'm going to, you know, add correlation here. I'm not going to check off like who's in my player pool. I'm going to just go and hit run and I'm going to upload those lineups. Cause what you're going to end up with is a lot of lineups towards the bottom of your lineup set that make no sense. 
that make mm -hmm. no sense at all. And you're just burning money. And that's what I think most people who are just trying to get familiar with optimizers do, because they think the optimizer has the answers when really the answers are inside you and the optimizer is a tool to help build those lineups more efficiently for you. Yeah. And I think, Leonie, it's a struggle for me when making a lot of lineups, and I very, very rarely do it. It's a struggle for me making a lot of lineups when it, I think to myself, man, I, I like this guy in cash. I think he's solid, but he's going to be 30, 40% owned. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to remove him because he's dust. And then, of course, like my cash lineup ends up as my, uh, it's, you guys don't know how many times yeah. this happened to me. Every time I run 50, 100 lineups, my cash lineup out of those 100 lineups ends up scoring the most points. And I just want to kill someone. <laughs> Leonie, how do you think about these cash kind of plays? Is it part of your plan to fade these cash kind of plays if you're making a lot of lineups? Yeah. Well, we did an episode uh, on Millie Maker tips and large field tournament tips and kind of talked about the optimal total ownership to have in your lineup. And, and basically, you want a team that has a combination of some high-owned players that are just good plays and some low-owned, high-leverage plays. Generally, the cumulative ownership between 75 to 125%. This is something that using optimizer settings can help you do that. And within that lineup, it's good to have the barbell approach where you take some cash game players that are just really good plays. You don't have to X out Derrick Henry at 40% owned. But you got to make sure that if you're playing Derrick Henry, you're not playing the other two 40% owned running backs. That's another thing. You can do groups and optimizers where you'd say, okay, these three running backs are all chalk. I understand why they're chalk and they're good cash game plays. I can't play them all in the same tournament lineup. I don't have enough leverage. That's too much ownership. You can set settings and say, you know, max one of those three or max two of those three running backs. So that's what Drew's saying when you have to really think through it and you can't just hit run. You know, there's a lot of dynamics here. And it will happen more frequently than you think that your cash game lineup outperforms a lot of these lineups, but your cash game line, if that happens, your cash game lineup wasn't going to win a tournament most of the time anyways, because that means all the really chalky players did very well that week. And the score that you need to win is, is incredibly high. Mm -hmm. um, so as frustrating as it seems on the surface, it's actually like not as much as the loss as it probably really is if you look at where we're a place within the standings. Okay, let's move on to point two, Dink, and this is micromanaging. I think this is something on the other end of the spectrum that people do. Some people just come in and hit run. Other people, like me, I got, I go through every lineup and I'm like, God, I can't face this. I start rerunning. Next thing I know, like six hours has gone by and I've rerun a thousand times. I don't even know what I have anymore. What do you mean by micromanaging when you're using an optimizer? Yeah. So that process of actually like reviewing the outputs of the lineups and rerunning and taking a few hours, that's pretty normal for me. Uh, so that's not what I would call in, in the micromanaging. The micromanaging aspect for me is when people get so specific on the exposures that they're trying to create by like every position at every portfolio that they're basically like, they're within striking distance of kind of what they want in their portfolio on a run, but they keep tinkering and keep tinkering. And the more that you restrict in terms of uh, the, the the roster limitations you're placing. Let's say you don't want to have any quarterbacks at you know more than 15% in, in your portfolio or whatever. Well, you need to immediately have more than seven, you know, more than six quarterbacks to be able to do that, right? So people put constraints on their runs that are too constrained and it doesn't allow the optimizer to create enough lineups. And so it, it makes the optimizer naturally like break rules or not create enough lineups for you. And so what I tend to do is I will tend to make kind of positional restrictions that I'll say, you know, I won't let, I won't have more than 25% of any wide receiver uh, in, in my portfolio. I won't have more than 15% of any quarterback. I won't have more than 15% of any defense as like rough estimates of what I'll do. Now, some of these, there might be exceptions every once in a while. And then what I'll do is I will run the optimizer and see the results. And if I'm starting to get, let's say like 14% of a quarterback that I really don't like as much, but the projection is really good on them, I might now limit that one quarterback. But what people start start doing immediately when they go in there is they start putting a, a roster cap on every single player that they're going through. And at the end, when you hit run, the optimizer is taking forever because there's so many limitations that it's trying to work through that it can't even create enough lineups. And so that's the area where I see people micromanaging so much that they're trying to get so perfect in what they're trying to accomplish 
that they end up making it so that the optimizer runs really slow, doesn't spit up uh, spit out enough lineups. And then when it comes Sunday morning in news changes and you're trying to adjust things and you've got all this like really tight constraints built in, you end up running out of time because you can't get the optimizer to run quickly enough based on all the constraints you've put in. So I think it's really important to be able to understand the levers that you can pull in the values that it adds, because some levers when you're pulling them are adding no value when you've pulled all these other levers. And so that's the thing about an optimizer is understanding there's all these different buttons that you can use to your advantage, but when you use them all at once, sometimes it actually is your disadvantage because it makes it tougher to build lineups on the whole. Let's move to adjusting rules for slates. And I think, I think by this dink, you mean, uh, different types of slates, not slate sizes. Leonia specialty is the smaller field stuff. And obviously most of that is being hand built, not optimizer built. But Dink, why don't you talk about what you mean here by adjusting rules for actual slates? Yeah. So very simply, if we are talking about slate sizes, that, that one I can answer really quickly because a four game slate, like when we get into the playoffs or whatnot, is different from a 13 game slate in terms of the rules that you should be considering and the approaches you should be taking. But it's also similar in the sense that the types of lineups that you should be making for a hundred thousand person entry contest is different from the types of lineups you should be building for a hundred person contest. And yes, you might go ahead and uh, hand build those lineups. But some people, what they'll do is they'll play 20 hundred person contests and they might want 20 different lineups and they might be using an optimizer for those. Well, you would want different rules in different settings because you're not shooting for as high of a ceiling in terms of the number of points that are necessary to win those types of contests. So just generally, and this all goes into the idea of you want to go in with a plan. What type of field am I playing? What type of contest am I playing? How big is this slate playing? And how do I need to adapt those rules for those situations? Because when you're playing a, a contest with 100,000 plus entries, you need to be almost perfect. So you want to do things like you know, have correlation, but limit the amount of correlation that you have because you don't want to go all in on one situation on a 13 game main slate with 100,000 plus entries in a contest. Meanwhile, if you're on a four game slate with 40 entries in a contest, you can go in on one game of those four because it's more likely that that one game can wildly outperform the other three than it is one game wildly outperforming another 12. And so those are the types of things that you want to think through as you're using an optimizer to your advantage is understanding kind of the scope of what game am I playing and what is the situation. And the biggest one that I see most often is very simply on like, you know, the opening night, Monday night football, where you have two games or whatever, people will run lineups where they don't allow opponent players versus their defense because they're used to doing that on 13 game slates because they view it as like inefficient. I don't want to running back against the, the fantasy defense that I'm playing because they're negatively correlated, but on a two game slate, you're naturally restricting lineups that actually might be winners because weirder things can happen. The smaller sample size that you're dealing with and negative correlation isn't as big of a deal. So it's these things that were, if you're not adjusting conceptually, how you're approaching to use the optimizer for the slate, you're playing or for the contest size that you're playing, you're naturally doing yourself a disadvantage. Leone, I want to bring it back to projections. And I think this is the biggest thing that people uh, have uh, misconceptions about. They don't realize how much goes into creating a good projection. And then if you're using a poor projection, if you're using bad projections in your optimizer, I mean, my God, you're just torching, absolutely torching money. Now, there's different things that we're going to talk about. In the next episode, we're going to talk about floor and ceiling and stuff like that, how you can use that to your advantage. Leonie, how do you think about projections when running a 150 set? Was I think is way different than thinking about projections when you're making a cash lineup. Yeah, I mean, there's two sides to it. The first side that we already talked about a little bit is you can't just hit print, you know, just hit run and expect to print money because... Uh, the, you know, there's more to the projections than just the base projection. There's the correlation between opponents. There's the roster ship of the, the different players on your team. And, but the, the flip side to it, when Drew was talking about micromanaging, you also, when you have good projections, you're at an advantage over your opponents because your exposures to players are on the correct side. You know, you're just getting the correct leverage times, hundreds of players that you might be rostering for the week. And they might be little things, but having 14% instead of 10% of a guy, because the projection is a little bit better than the projection the field is using. That's a big deal over the course of a season. You know, you're just racking up these little tiny, you know, plus EV edges by having good projections. And you want to trust them to an extent. You don't want to overly 
micromanage and just say like, oh, I don't really like that guy, even though he projects well. If you find yourself doing that too much, you know, they're either the projections you're using aren't, aren't that good. Or if you're using our projections, they're good because I back tested them and we put so much work into them and I know they are you're probably assuming too much control and going too far down the rabbit hole. And you're uh, kind of like Drew was saying with the different levers, you pull some that don't help. You might be pulling one that doesn't help there when you're you know, bypassing what's supposed to be an edge for you, which is having a better idea of how players are going to perform. Yeah. Dink, how do you think about projections and base projections and median projections when you're doing a 150 set? Well, one of the first things that I think about, and this is something that um, Mike has, has talked about in depth, uh, throughout his DFS career, but there's different levels of fragility to projections that not everybody understands and thinks through contextually. And it's something that we, you know, try to add a lot of contextual value to through the content that we create on shows and, and articles and different things. But there's certain situations that each and every week they have kind of a tighter range of outcomes because we kind of know what the teams are going to do. Um, it's easier to understand in basketball because basketball, you see the fragility of projections like really clearly, but some rotations are really clear in basketball. You know exactly like who's going to play, how many minutes, you know, how many guys are going to play and so on and so forth. And in some situations, because injuries blow up everything, they're guesses. And we're just guessing at, you know, they're, they're educated guesses, but they're still guesses. We don't have a lot of history to kind of look at and say, like, we feel really confident. And so the fragility in projections is one thing that I think most DFS players that are thinking through kind of MME sets are maybe not taking into enough consideration. And so you'll get these situations where it's a new situation that we're projecting that we don't know much about. We're taking our best stab at it and you get into a really chalky situation from a player that is a really fragile projection. And those are situations where you naturally can take the advantage of understanding, okay, this, pro this projection situation Mike and the ETR team have never seen this before. They're giving their best guess at this possible, but the field is going to use this like really, really heavily. How do I take this to, to my advantage? In that situation, I might be lowering that player's projection. So I have less of them than the field in my lineups and different things like that. And I think that's one area that we take projections sort of as gospel is that all these projection situations are similar and we have similar levels of confidence in every single projection. And that's simply not the case because certain situations are just ones that we've seen a lot and we have a lot of confidence in and certain situations are ones that we haven't seen as much and we're guessing at. I mean, one of the beautiful things about NFL and NFL DFS is that it is not, I mean, the range is so much wider than other sports, you know, and so the range of outcomes is so much wider and that creates a lot of opportunity for people to find nuance. And I think that that's a huge, huge part of playing tournaments and playing them well, finding nuance in the projections. Just some projection uh, set is not going to be the end all and be all in NFL for sure. Last point here, Dink, that I want to make people mistakes you see people making when using an optimizer set and forget. I think we've touched on this a bit already, but anything you want to say on the mistake you people see people making set and forget? Yeah. So the big thing is, I think once you've hit run, like you've, you've figured out all the different levers that you want to pull and you look and you see the exposures to the individual players and they all sort of like look okay and you feel pretty good about that. I think a lot of people We'll stop even before that. But even if you've gotten to that point, there's still one more step that I think you should be doing, which is scrolling through all the lineups all down to 150 and just look through and see like, is that are those all lineups you think you would play in that tournament if you were hand building? Because really what the optimizer you're trying to do is you're trying to get quicker versions of what you would hand build if you could build a lineup. You're giving it a framework to build all these things. And when you're going through that review, you might just find stuff that naturally helps you think of other rules to create. And you might have something where you have like, you know, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett with Russell Wilson. And then you have a third Seattle pass catcher and you're looking at these lineups and it's like, 60% of my salary is going to the Seattle passing game. That's probably not going to be a high enough ceiling outcome for me to win a hundred thousand plus entry tournament. And so that might help you create a rule that's like max two Seattle pass catchers with Russell Wilson or different things like that. And I think just going through the lineups and just giving them a cursory review. And obviously the closer that you're running to lock, the harder that it's going to be to accomplish this. So when news changes, you might not always be able to do this. But in preparation of Sunday mornings, when you've gone through kind of your optimizer runs, I think dedicating time to actually review the outputs and make sure that things look good. Or similarly, like when we talked about in terms of like roster ship percentage being too far extreme, you might have a lineup that projects 
for like 40% of the total rosters. And that's like way too low. And so you might just be able to create rules or groups or different things that can help you create better lineups by actually reviewing them as opposed to just hitting run, uploading and moving on. If you can believe it, this is merely, this has been merely a kind of surface level uh, optimizer 101 review. It gets far, far deeper. And for help with how to use an optimizer far, far, far deeper. Again, I highly recommend people check out Dink's articles on the site and Dink's screen shares and videos on the site and on YouTube for how to dive deeper into using an optimizer. It's just way, way, way more complicated than people imagine. If I had infinite time, if I was on full-blown team no sex, I actually think I would make 150 lineups myself by hand. I mean, that's just full-blown team no sex though. But again, Dink, the whole point of this, as Dink just said, is getting 100D lineups quickly that we would make by hand. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Again, if you're interested in using an optimizer this year, head to the drop down from the subscribe tab. You'll see the link to the Fantasy Labs add-on. Part two of our DFS podcast series is in the books. We'll be back with part three tomorrow. Four, Dink. Four, Leone. Four, Bruce Luke. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.